Ah, okay, there's the red button. Uh, so it's recording now. So that's okay. What about the webinar side? Or the web, uh, is that also working? I don't know if there's a difference in that. I'm new to Zoom and, and, and oh, yeah. online. This is a little different than Zoom. Um, okay. The, the, the webinar in Zoom, the principle is people should talk and you actually have dialogue. With webinar, the viewers cannot, do not have audio. So they can only mm -hmm. chat and write in questions. And um, uh, the, also the question and answer is different. In Zoom, um, yeah. people write, uh, the viewers can write questions on the chat. Here, they actually uh, write questions on the Q and A. Good. Thank you, John. I'm glad you tuned in, a student tuned in. We're preparing for the four o'clock. Um, so we will wait. So I want to make sure you can hear me okay, and yeah, I don't need to use pretty this. good. Okay. Good. It's pretty good. Right, Shelly? Can you hear pretty well? Yeah, definitely. And how about for me? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, great. Great. Welcome to the early joiners. Uh, we had an early uh, recording, uh, so uh, you'll get a head start uh, from the four o'clock start. And uh, we welcome you um, to the webinar this afternoon. And yeah, Puerto Rico is actually having one of the most interesting elections this coming election too. Uh, we have for the, the first time a viable possible third party that has been uh, two parties pretty much dominating. And so it's going to be really interesting. I mean, at the end, we could end up with the same story, but there is also the millennium impact, you know, on how they could transform the election. It's big in Puerto Rico as well. Is that on November 3rd? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Same day, yeah. Okay, yeah. great. And everything, so, uh-huh. Well, okay. I'll be looking forward to looking at the results. We're having an election night event, and um, if the online feed uh, includes anything about Puerto Rico, I will be thinking of you, Belinda. Belinda, Perfect. what are the politics of the third party? Well, the politics of Puerto Rico has been all about this, the status of Puerto Rico. So it's either statehood, you know, pro ELA, the, the current status, the colonial status, or independence. That every election people vote kind of for a status instead of a governor. So there's a new group that is saying, let's combine the ideologies and the ideas and have a party that actually administers whatever this thing is. And then we talk about status later. So that sparks a lot. I mean, in a way, those are kind of like religious, passed on by religion, you know. These, uh, so the new generation is really calling for, there is so much corruption and, and other things that let's just really administer well and then talk about what status we would be. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. It's interesting. Well, thank you for that uh, snapshot of politics in Puerto Rico. Our <laughs> participants uh, who signed on early uh, got a treat 
to hear about um, what's going on in Puerto Rico. Let me uh, use the four o'clock hour to welcome everyone to the Zoom webinar on the presidential election of 2020. And before we get to the, this week's topic, uh, which is immigration uh, and our two wonderful guests, I want to uh, mention that we always have new people uh, joining. Uh, I want to introduce myself. I'm Joel Cassiola and I am a member of the political science department. And it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this Zoom webinar. Before we get to uh, this afternoon's presentations, I want to make clear uh, the first quiz for the students who are enrolled for credit uh, will be available beginning tonight uh, at 12.01. And the quiz will be accessible for an entire week uh, until uh, next Wednesday at 11.59. There are 20 questions, multiple choice questions on the first four presentations uh, that we have seen. The Electoral College, the pandemic crisis, the economy, and the environment. Today's topic will be included on the second quiz, which I will give you more details as we move forward. If you have any questions or if you have an issue that one way or another prevents you from taking the quiz, please write to me on email at my uh, email address, which is available on the syllabus. If you have an issue, for example, I just got a message about the fires and a student of mine is being evacuated. Uh, we will do everything, I will certainly do everything we can to accommodate you even though three quizzes are required, uh, you can take the quiz at a later time um, when things are better. So again, let me say, if you have a question or a concern about the quiz to please write me and I will uh, try to respond as quickly as I can. Uh, today's topic, uh, and is one that was one of the most hotly uh, debated topics uh, in 2016. I find it as a political scientist uh, interesting uh, that the uh, dialogue between the two major candidates has not really turned to immigration yet. And we still have about five weeks left before election day. So with that, let, uh, let me introduce our first speaker, Professor Belinda Reyes. And uh, Belinda is a member of the Latina and Latino Studies Department, holding the title of Associate Professor. Um, she holds a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley in the field of economics. Belinda is an expert in demographics, education, immigration, urban economics, opportunity youth, and the social and economic progress of Latinx in the United States. As the director of the Cesar Chavez Institute, Dr. Reyes generated hundreds of thousands of dollars in research funds and opportunities for students. Belinda is also an adjunct fellow at the Public Policy Institute of California. Previously, 
She was a founding faculty member at the University of California, Merced, and a research fellow at the Public Policy Institute of California. Belinda, it's a pleasure to have you here this afternoon. My pleasure. So that background really gives you an idea of, uh, of how I view issues and how policy is central to my work. Uh, uh, my first job was at a, at a think tank, at a public policy institute. And, and I don't know if this age <laughs> that is making me think that history is so important that uh, I'm really uh, doing a lot of history lessons in my classes right now. And, and the period of the early 1900s have so much in common with what we're experiencing today that it's been amazing actually to, to, to review this history. Um, so I, and I've been discussing, this is actually a presentation from one of my classes. Uh, in fact, let me start sharing. How about that? Um, and it is very much, uh, I tell them that, that, that I'm, can you see my screen now? Can you see yeah. it? The PowerPoint? Okay. Yes. Um, let, me, let me see if I could go here. How about that? Does that That's work? Great. Yeah. Um, that, that I really, it's been, it's been, especially in this election that so much is, in a way, uh, we are ignoring history, we're ignoring science, we're doing many things that, that make me think that we behave like a child in, in, in some moments. And, and history, to me, seems like when we ignore history, we behave like a child. We, we, we think we're doing things the first time when we realize that, and we examine history that, you know, we've been thinking about this for a long time. Or, or, or we think also we create this feeling of grandeur as if we're fixing problems that actually has been talked about for years or have been resolved in other ways in other places. So I really feel that, that, that examining how we've been thinking about this topic and how, how it's been present since the formation of our nation makes it a much more mature way of then thinking about what kind of policy do we respond to. Uh, because we see how it has impacted us and we see how our thinking has developed to where we are, you know? So, so the thing I tell my students too is that it's very easy to manipulate us if we don't know history. So that's another reason why I really have been hammering history a lot in my classes because I think once we know that what has happened, we could really be the judge of what the values that we want to carry into the future, you know? So, so as a background, uh, that's why I, I, I've been looking at, at, at history, and especially history of immigration. Um, it's the history of humanity. I mean, we would not be the humans we are today if we would have never migrated. So, so, so this is part of what defines us as a successful human being, that we moved and we look for better places to, to form our societies and we adjusted to the newcomers, even though we always resisted them, they transformed and created better societies. And, and that is not just the story of the United States, that really is the story of humanity in many ways. Uh, so thinking then about the United States, I really, uh, when you look at immigration policy, it really hasn't been the result of, of, of a plan. It really has been the result of, 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 of no philo of philosophy or a coherent plan. It has been the result of moments I need labor and I want to industrialize or I want to move to the West and I'm just going to let anybody in. And then I get a little scared that there's too many of them or there is an economic crisis and I want to kick them out. You know, so those political pressures, also international pressures, changes in ideology, uh, Russian revolutions, uh, I mean, international so, uh, events also have influenced our policy. But it's been really transforming depending on about our economic needs and, 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 and those economic fluctuations in many places. And again, this debate comes from the beginning of the formation of the nation and issues of race and 
in many cases, very blatant racism has been present in our policy from the beginning. So we cannot divorce the conversation of immigration from a conversation of race. Uh, it's been there from the beginning. In some moments, very explicit. And, and we have gone, in, in, I think in the United States, from the image on the left, this image of the nation of immigrants, the Statue of Liberty in the background, and that land of opportunity to, towards this homeland security apparatus that has, is creating fear of immigration as a possible terrorist attack. Uh, so immigrants are not, and the nation is not this nation, more and more we're becoming the police state uh, anti-immigrant rhetoric. And not just anti-immigrant, but threat to the nation uh, the immigrant uh, is to the, to the United States now. Uh, so very different view of the nation uh, right now and the images of who, who we are. Uh, and I think, you know, behind this, the, the immigration question, there's these three basic questions. You know, how many immigrants do we let into the country? Who we, who we let into the countries? What, what kind of immigrant we admit? And then what rights do we give them once they enter the country? You see the debate? It's around these three basic questions. And this is the basic questions for many nations. Uh, for example, Dubai have very open borders to immigration, but nobody has rights. Only a very minute proportion of the population that are mostly immigrants in Dubai have any rights. Uh, in Haiti, for example, in Haiti, no, I'm sorry, in the Dominican Republic today, the Supreme Court decided that Haitians, even third generation Haitians have no citizen rights in, in the Dominican Republic. Even though they share the same island, share a complete history, that nation decided that Haitians have no privilege. Even third generation Haitians have no privilege. So how a nation responds to these three questions, it expresses their values and their histories and these conversations about race as well. Uh, but you will see them in every debate about immigration. And the other issues that you see frame the conversation are, are, are these two. Uh, the size of the immigrant population as a comparison to the US population, okay? So the share of immigrants as a share, uh, as a, uh, how many, with the proportion of immigrants in the US population. So, so this chart, let me see if you can see my line, which looks a little complicated. But, oh, hold on, my dog is barking. Uh, but this is the actual number, and the lighter green shows you the actual number of immigrants from 1850, that was one of the earlier years of immigration, Lola, to 2014. And then this darker one, which the numbers are on this side, is the rate, the, the proportion of the U.S. population that are foreign-born. So in here, I mean, I like looking at, for example, this, this point in here, you know, it's not one of the highest numbers of immigrants. I, I left. But in these periods, because the U.S. population, hold on a second, let me try to call my daughter. Lola! Because, then, I'm sorry about that. Because the U.S. population was so small, you know, even though this number is so much smaller than we're talking in here, the, hold on one second, let me get my dog here. We'll talk with the dog. Yeah. Uh, she'll stay calm if she's with me. So the share of the immigrant population was really large compared to the size of the United States. So, you saw urban places of, of the East Coast very much a high proportion of immigrants, you know, but more towards the, the center of the country in smaller proportions. So the share of immigrants, what, how much larger is the immigrant population as compared to the U.S. is very important. And we see that we are back into a period in which about 14% of the U.S. population was born abroad. It's immigrant. 
The other is the demographics. Where do they come from? You know, uh, you have seen significant debates about immigration in periods in which they can, they, they, a different type of immigrant is coming to the United States. So these are, were three periods that I thought were, were really important. In, in, in 1820, uh, you see, you know, the majority of the immigrants are either from Ireland or the United Kingdom. And then you see France and, and Germany kind of starting to, to, to immigrate. Uh, but by the time you get to the 1870s, you know, you're talking about a very small proportion of the foreign born were coming really from Ireland or the United Kingdom. Now Germany was a significant proportion of immigrants. And, you know, from other parts, this is actually the rest of the world. Once we get to the early 1900s, you really don't see the United Kingdom or Ireland as any of the top five sending countries. You're talking really about Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. So the conversations about immigration were really strong in this period, were very strong in this period, because the demographics of the immigrant population were changing. And the other thing you notice too is that you know, the dominance of the Northern Europeans and the, uh, at least the United Kingdom was really earlier in the immigration process. Uh, it transformed, you know, we were receiving immigrants from throughout the world uh, pretty early in the United States. Um, so there were all the, the, also two big issues are central to the to the conversation of our immigration, and you see it even from the creation of, of you know from the time of the Constitution, and that is you know how do we maintain a united nation? You know you, you, that conversation. Uh, I think Joel could talk more about that than I. The conversation about the creation of the nation is really about how do we maintain the unity of, of, of the United States. Uh, and then, you know, if you think about Europe having wars all over the place and the Americas going through an independence, this question of unity, I understand, was very important. But how do we create unity is the debate. Do we need an Anglo Saxon culture and a homogeneous culture to create this unity? or values, principles, shared histories, legal institutions, you know, other things create that unity that, uh, that creates that nation, you know. So that's one of the big debates that, that we experience, you know, how do we maintain the unity? Many argue we have to support Anglo-Saxon and, and make sure that everybody comes from that region because otherwise, you know, that threatens the unity of the nation. And the other is the loyalty to the nation. You know, you see the idea of the values or the character of these new groups, the other, influencing us in some sort of way that it damages this, this, this country that we have created. You see that from the, you know, from, from the time of the French Revolution, you see this, and, and at the beginnings of the nation. How do that other, influences what we define as the, the value of the nation and then the loyalty to the nation. Uh, in a way, that's why the president cannot be an immigrant uh, because of this notion that uh, it has to have loyalty to the nation. Uh, but again, how we maintain and how we decide to, to, to create this loyalty and this unity may not have anything to do with culture and everything to do with stable institutions and, and values, common values, uh, like democracy and liberty. Uh, but this frames the debate of immigration as well as the three other questions that I was mentioning. How many immigrants, what type of immigrant, and what rights to give them once they come in. So these are the three, you know, the, the four periods of, of immigration that most people uh, uh, frame, there's the three waves that relate to the moment of uh, you know, after the nation, uh, after the nation becomes the United States, after the Civil War, and then after uh, the Immigration Reform and Control, for, sorry, the Hart Seller Act in 1965. And then now we talk very much about the period after September 11th has become very much a period of homeland security. And what you see throughout this period is again, remember those two images at the beginning? the image of the nation accepting immigrants uh, 
here, much more restrictions, openness, and then again, very serious restrictions uh, moving with political processes and economic processes. So I'm gonna go a little quickly to this one. This is really pre-revolutionary pre, uh, period. Uh, open borders completely, uh, incentivizing immigration, but also, uh, as we know, 40% of the immigration was involuntary, were slaves being brought without them wanting to. And uh, another big proportion of them, indentured servitude. So people that came and ended up being, uh, 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 in a way, almost slaves to a landlord that would give them housing. And you know, we, we, we know also the conditions of indentured ser servitude. So, so the need for labor created very ugly conditions even at the beginning of, of, of the nation in terms of the relationship to labor. But in this period and in the next period after, the, after, the, after independence, the control over immigration was very much at the state level or at the colonial state level. The federal level doesn't come in until much later, really the end of the 1800s. So most of the policies were being decided at the state level. After independence, uh, immigration enters mainly uh, through the restriction of slaves um, and protection in, against indentured servitude as well. But as I mentioned, free immigration, except the president cannot be an immigrant, uh, but they could be senators. And, and there were some early reservations that you see in the writings, for especially Jefferson, afraid of uh, countries that were ruled by monarchs. This idea that maybe their ideas are anti-democratic, you know, this idea of the loyalty of the nation really comes in, uh, even from the beginning. Uh, so that, that leads to the Alien and Sedition Act, that is one of the first uh, kind of federal legislations. But what was happening? I mean, you had in seven, you had the French Revolution happening in, in Europe, and then you have the Haitian Revolution taking place in the United States, 1791. That was the first nation to become independent in the America, in the in the Latin in the Americas, and it was a black rebellion. So talk about uh, white supremacy. This was a major challenge to white supremacy and a black led black ruled nation early in 1791. Uh, this was very much a challenge to white supremacy and very much a challenge to the ideas of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, animal-like people that couldn't rule themselves and needed the European to be able to, to rule. So the ideas of the Haitian Revolution were very uh, transformational in the Americas, inspired Bolivar and inspire in many ways uh, Latin American independence. Uh, in fact, Haiti funded Bolivar and gave uh, 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 um, uh, armies to Bolivar to, to win the fights of independence. And the challenge also was slavery. I mean, in this period, the in engine of growth was slavery. So these two people were challenging this very much, very early in, in the 1700s. Uh, so those ideas, especially to the South, uh, were, were not really, really good. So, so, so we're, we're against the principles and, and the economic future and the economic engine of the South. So that's how you get to this Alien and Sedation Act very early. But, but I think these two people have influence in many ways. Well, they, 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 what they symbolize. Uh, Martí was also talking very similar things that Bolívar was talking at the time. The fear of the United States uh, colonialism, uh, uh, imperialism, and, and then the ideas of, of the French Revolution that meant nobody's a slave, which challenged economic structures uh, were taking place in this period. In the US, you were having very much the Monroe Doctrine. You know, this is period of complete expansion for the United States. Uh, the purchase of Luciana and Guadalupe Hidalgo is, is in this particular period. Gold Rush in California is in this period. Uh, 
So you have the United States expanding westward and expanding south as well. In fact, I came across uh, uh, proposals to annex uh, parts of South America, parts of Central America, to go as far as Nicaragua and El Salvador and what it is now El Salvador and Guatemala and all of those countries. I think in 1850 something. Uh, so very much a desire to expand the nation. But at the same time, uh, you had in Europe uh, uh, now more of the German and more German and Irish European coming to the United States. And, and you had industrial revolution happening in, in, in Europe. Uh, I think it's actually 1848 that Marx is writing uh, uh, the Communist Manifesto because of the, the conditions in Europe. Uh, so, so Jefferson is also thinking, hey, industrialization is happening. We used to mainly give land to people and say, okay, go over there and, and farm. He started thinking, hey, we need craft people. We need skilled workers. We need to start industrializing the East. So in this period, you also start seeing going to other places to admit not just people to go and farm, but you start getting the development of the East Coast and the cities in the East Coast. And that was very much immigrants that, that were doing uh, that uh, uh, development of our, of our urban cities. The rest of the US population was uh, more rural. This is a little bit more about the manifest uh, destiny that was ruling, I mean, very much of a sense by the United States. I think uh, Trump is one of the, the first presidents that says we don't have this responsibility. We're not the police chief of the nation or the police guard of the Americas. But in this period, uh, there was very much the idea and through the 19, early 1900s, that the United States was granted by God the idea to expand and grow. And, and that justified the killing of the Native Americans and invasions in many Latin American countries uh, throughout the decades. And the expansion also of the United States in the West and, 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 and many other things. So moving now after the Civil War, uh, we had another period of very large immigration. Uh, again, what you're experiencing is expansion of the United States, what you're experiencing is industrialization. And other very, very critical thing that you're seeing is technological improvements in shipping, irrigation, railways are expanded to, to the West and to the South. They were going all the way down Mexico. Uh, La Bestia that we talk about, you know, it's very old and, and was part of this expansion of railway to the Americas. So you are seeing the, what United, United States becomes United States in this period, uh, the large uh, production of manufacturing and the large agriculture takes place. So that needed labor like crazy. That needed workers and doors were open to workers. But again, as they begin to diversify, uh, they start looking a little bit different. Now we start getting more Southern Europeans, Eastern Europeans, and Asian immigrants. The expansion of the railways were, were Asian immigrants that, that helped make that happen. Uh, you see even starting actually in California, uh, a move towards federal registrations. We need to stop really started with uh, vilifying uh, Asian immigrants. Okay, let me skip that. Uh, so, so you see more of an emphasis on, on, on more and more controls. And, and this is really the period that um, I actually I started reading, going back to this election, I started reading uh, the, the, the niece, Trump's niece book. And in this first book, she talks about how his family actually came was from Germany, they were Jewish from Germany, and came in this period to work, you know, uh, in construction and development of, of many of the areas in the East Coast. And they, in the book, she talks about how he was part of this immigrant political machinery that controlled, you know, New York City at this period. So it's very interesting to hear Trump's story really being this immigrant story 
uh, of, of this particular period. Uh, uh, let me skip some of this. So going back to this, this is really a period that we start getting much more restrictions. This really started in California and it was very race-based. This was very much an eight and very racist anti-Asian policy, very much a Chinese. Uh, and 1862 was the first one, but there's also a Japanese gentleman agreement and there's more and more restrictions to specific categories of people uh, and specific categories of, uh, for example, there is uh, laws that start more and more federal registration, uh, re uh, restrictions on, for example, prostitution. But it really was uh, any woman that came by themselves was considered a prostitute and was restricted immigration. Uh, criminals was also uh, used in many cases to restrict particular people or particular groups. So more and more this became essential to have uh, immigration policies that, that were more federally based. And it's really not until 1891 that you established immigration reform. Well, what it was at that period, the homeland security, the beginnings of the homeland security. Uh, so we didn't have, I mean, when you think about it, it's been about 100 years, a little bit of uh, about 120 years that we have a federal immigration controls uh, in the United States. But I'll show you also some numbers, and, and Joel, tell me about timing, because I, I want to make sure that, that I don't take Shelley's time. Sure. Okay, so, so because of these new immigrants, and because what was happening is these restrictions were not leading to what they wanted. I mean, they really wanted workers that would be very productive, and that won't complain, uh, really, was the desired worker. Uh, so they kept trying to find, for example, anarchists were excluded. Uh, they kept trying to find categories of groups that, that, that could be excluded. So they thought, okay, what about literacy requirements? And at some point they thought, okay, we need to come up uh, with some, uh, some sort of a more precise plan. And they did a study in the early 1900s, I think it's actually 1910, uh, and, and they came up with a study about the impact of the immigrants, who were the immigrants in the United States, and then made recommendations to the federal government about policy. That is the Dillingham Report. And these are some of the quotes uh, from the report. Uh, many of the complaints were about uh, Italians, Germans, there was uh, Dutch, uh, there was a lot of fear about Germans moving into isolated communities and speaking German. Uh, so very similar conversations to what we hear today about Latinos. Um, for Latinos, and, and, and they talk about Mexicanos, the idea was uh, we don't like them, we don't think they can assimilate, but at least they go away, <laughs> was uh, uh, the, the rhetoric. They work hard, but they don't want to stay, you know. So we don't think they should be assimilating. So do you see the mentality that led to the many deportations of Mexicans later uh, that, that, you know, we want the arm, we want the worker, but we don't want the family and we don't want them to stay. You know, very much of an idea of, 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 of the Dillingham report. And then a threat, the idea of this threat to the nation of the Italian, there was many uh, uh, suggestions about uh, that the Italians were not fed, they, were, they didn't have the characteristics of the prior immigrant groups. And uh, really, uh, it's an interesting thing to look at, uh, thinking about our history today. But they suggested very limiting uh, immigration in different ways. They tried the literacy requirement, but they ended up with something that was, oy, where did I go? Let me go here. They it started with a literacy requirement, but really what, what made the difference was something that was in effect for actually about 40 years, the Quota Act. And this is a very specific race-based policy. Really, there, there, there's not, no way around it. But this policy said, we really want to go back to the immigrants that we liked, that were those Northern Europeans, 
And, and we are going to say, uh, we're going to base our immigration policy on a time when they were the majority of the immigrants. And then we're going to base the numbers of immigrants that we allow on that number. So it was very much favor uh, Western Europeans, mainly Northern Western Europeans, at the expense of the Southern, you know, Italians and Greeks and the, and the, and the Eastern Europeans. Western uh, immigration from the Western Hemisphere, so Latin America, for example, was not included in the quota. Okay, so immigration from the Western Hemisphere was open. Uh, there were moments in which legal requirements were, were in, in, in force, but there were no numerical limits until 1965 on uh, migration, immigration from Latin America. So again, when you think about it, if it's 1965, again, it's about 50 years that we have had restrictions on immigration from the Western Hemisphere. It's very recent. So let me just put this, this is again the number of immigrants coming to the United States, the total number, the total number of immigrants in the US. So it's not a flow number, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, the total number here. And then this is the Chinese Exclusionary Act when the immigration reform, when, when Homeland Security is created, and then the Dillingham Report. But what happened after that is two wars, a Great Depression, and immigration flattened. So the Quota Act, definitely this is now the Quota Act, had a major impact in terms of the, the determining, and there was a, 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 on determining the type of immigrant that came in, but the wars and the Great Recession also had a huge impact on immigration. There was very little immigration coming from Europe in this period. So most of the immigration really was from, from Latin America uh, at this period. But since there were no restrictions, you know, uh, the data that we get is limited. Um, another thing that happens in this period, as I mentioned, is the, the wars and then the Cold War. Uh, but before, you know, during the war period, uh, the United States and Mexico uh, make an agreement that we need workers to be able to, to work uh, in, 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 you know, during the time of the war, but even after the war, make a, a bilateral agreement to export labor uh, that brought, I forgot exactly the number, but millions of Braceros, millions of Mexican immigrants to the United States. They were also doing very similar uh, uh, type Bracero programs in Puerto Rico, where I'm from. Uh, in fact, the first group of Puerto Ricans went to, in the early 1900s, to Hawaii to work in the sugar mills in Hawaii. Uh, and there were Bracero type programs also bringing Puerto Ricans to the East Coast, to the factories. I think, Joel, you, you, you probably know more about this than I. Uh, a lot of, there was a, a center for immig Puerto Rican immigrants in New York City that would send the Puerto Rican immigrants to, to different places to work in factories. So there was uh, labor recruitment in the Americas uh, and very much in Mexico that remember about a third of our land was part of Mexico at some point. So, so there was always, a, there's a history, there is a territorial history, and there is a, 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 a bilateral agreements between the two nations of a dependence of labor for, for many, many years, with Mexico in particular. Uh, 4.6 million contracts. And what they say also was that many people were coming uh, undocumented during the time of Braceros, they will cross them, make them part of a Brazilian program, and then bring them back. So, so it was very much of an open door with Mexico uh, up until 1964. Um, the, so we have a quota act in the United States uh, at this period. And you have at the Second World War with refuge, Jewish refugees trying to escape Germany. And you also have the Cold War and all the wars that have started to take place in, in, in Asia. So Cambodian, Vietnam, uh, uh, Korean wars. And we have a quota. 
so we're trying in terms of, of refugees and the idea, the idea of the democracy and the window of democracy to the world did not match a quota, did not want an explicitly discriminatory policy. When you are talking that you are uh, the democratic nation and that you give voice to the underrepresented in you know, wars in, uh, against communism, and then you're also having uh, uh, many refugees from, from Europe, and you have a restriction on, on, on immigration. So these inconsistencies and, and not being prepared for refugees uh, really needed to transform the policy and put a lot of pressure, uh, the Asian exclusions as well, put a lot of pressure on the government to transform. And the other thing that's taking place at this period is the civil rights movement in the United States. So you're battling, you're saying again that you're in the window of democracy in the world, but you are having you know, race uh, battles in the United States. So what leads to this, that it's so, so it forces the civil rights movement and I, I would say the Cold War forces uh, a change in policy. Uh, Kennedy also advocated for this. And uh, before his death, he published a book called the Na A Nation of Immigrants, in which he advocates to put an end to the quota that it is not a, the value of our nation uh, to, to, to have something like a quota act and that we should be looking at immigrants differently. And he argues against the Dillingham report ideas that immigrants actually have been contributing to the nation and has been the ones that have been building the nation. So after his murder in, uh, in 1964, 1965, they passed the Hard Seller Act that pretty much ends the quota act the quotas and, um, and, and transform how, we, how federal government handles immigration. And then you also know all the other legislations of the civil rights movement that take place. So, I, sorry, I wanted to talk about that law first, but okay. So let me put these things in context again. You know, we are talking about Bracero program and the immigration laws that were still restrictive, but now we get uh, Brown, ver oh, I'm sorry. So we're here to Brown versus Board of Education. Immigration is flat until this period. We still have a quota act, okay? And, um, and again, as I mentioned, uh, Kennedy writes uh, Nation of the Immigrants. So in 1965, they passed the Hard Seller Act. It ends the, the national quotas and eliminates also all the exclusions on, uh, on Asian immigrants uh, coming. And there were citizens exclusions also on Asian immigrants in this, in this period. So all of this is ended after Kennedy's killed and uh, they passed this, this uh, legislation. But then this is the first time that the Western Hemisphere is included in any uh, restrictions on immigration in the United States. Uh, so they create a world ceiling of 290,000 uh, people that are able to enter annually. And it's the first time, as you see, that 170,000 of those come from the Western Hemisphere. This has been adjusted to, I think it's 20,000 per country. And the numbers keep varying. But the critical issue is that, that one of the complaints about the act is that it, it just set a ceiling without considering histories of migration. So it's just the same amount for everybody. So Philippines, for example, that has a history with the United States uh, and large immigration gets the same number as Chile that barely sends any immigrants. You know, So that's why you get the long waits for family members in terms of family reunification, sometimes 20, 30 years for, a, for somebody to be able to qualify for a visa if they try through the legal process. Uh, because of the way this legislation defined it, uh, didn't take into account these histories or vary the numbers by nation. 
the other criticism to, to this legislation was, okay, by not considering that, uh, the migration flows were not gonna end. So instead of uh, having these people that were entering legally, now you have them entering illegally. The flow continued. You just changed their name from a legal migrant to an illegal migrant now. Uh, so, so it increased family reunification. It didn't address the issue of refugees, so it continued to have an issue of refugees. And then many say it created the undocumented immigration that we see today. Uh, in terms of refugees, the United States actually didn't uh, join the United Nations on the definition of refugees and started to address refugees in a consistent policy until the 1980s. So again, think about it. it this is about 40 years. We have real refugee policy uh, with the standards of the United Nations that mean a refugee is somebody escaping persecution or have fear for their lives our policies very much responded to the Cold War or political interests that we had. Uh, it still kind of does, but, but at least now we have a, a policy starting in the 1980s. Um, let me see, oh, not that one. So, okay, so we passed the 1965 legislation and we developed a refugee policy and look what happened to immigration. So many argue, especially some of the anti-immigrant, anti that, that this legislation was really what led to the problems that we are facing today. And they want to go back to a period that we have a quota act again, the way we could control the type of immigrant that comes to the United States. And now the floodgates are open and that we don't have any control for the type of immigrant that comes in. So from that point forward, from 1965 forward, what you see is more and more the second image that we had on the second slide. So more and more the fear of this undocumented immigrant, which again, it's the same immigrant that was coming before to work, but now under a category that doesn't allow them to come in. Uh, but more and more that agricultural worker becomes uh, a threat. So, so you see policies more and more restrictive, more and more border controls. And what you hear is more of a desire for a comprehensive set of policies that, it, that, that, that don't emphasize just the border, but that also involve employers, that also involve legalization. Uh, that took place in 1986 with a Republican president. This was actually Reagan that signed uh, probably one of the most progressive uh, legislation since the Immigration Reform and Control Act uh, that, that had that comprehensive view of, okay, I will do some border controls. This was kind of the beginning of that. Uh, but we would also do employer sanctions and we, we will work with employers, but we also legalize. Uh, and there was a big amnesty. But again, from that point forward, it's really been policies focusing on the undocumented flow and on penalizing and criminalizing more and more this pattern of migration. Um, then September 11th happened, and that has made even more of a police state. In fact, uh, now we have not an Immigration Reform and Control Act, uh, 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 I'm sorry. Now you, you, in a way, had a citizen service and a, 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 an enforcement agency. Now very much is an enforcement view on immigration control. and. Um, and Homeland Security is actually one of the biggest agencies right now in, in, in the federal level, has more agents than I think any police, uh, I think, uh, and it, it's, I think it's the third largest agency in, in the federal government right now. So very much about uh, enforcing and criminalizing. And when you look at the last presidents before Trump, 
they were not that different on immigration policy either. I mean, Obama really ended up being called the, the, the deporter in chief. He deported more people than, than W. Bush. And, you know, he, he started with secure communities that was very much uh, enforcement in internal communities with political pressure. He kind of stepped away, but, but he did do a lot of deportations that were not just criminal deportations or criminal agents. Uh, and I'll show you some of that. And he did do DACA, but kind of at the end, you know, so I think they, in fact, both of these presidents supported comprehensive immigration and both were very virulent pro immigrant, but there was no real legislation. And, and they ended up being very much about enforcement. And again, when you look historically, you know, the period of Obama, uh, a lot of the deportations were non-criminal. So, you know, so uh, let me skip this. So this is also about the characteristics of the immigrants. I'm going to give this presentation to Joel so he could distribute it to, all, to you. Uh, but let me skip some of this. Um, but let me go to this one. Okay, again, this is the, the chart of the total number of immigrants. So this includes refugees, asylum seekers, permanent residents, and undocumented immigrants. This is the undocumented number. Okay, this is the total number of undocumented immigrants in the United States. And this is what has been, in fact, this is going down now. The peak was 2006. No, the peak was around here. And this, this has been going down. So we have been spending a lot of the policy talking about this population, not this population, which is most of the immigrants in the United States. Uh, the focus has been on this numbercito that is actually has been going down by itself. And then this is some of the, the numbers. Uh, the peak was in this, in, in this year, in 2007. And it has particularly been going down for undocumented immigrants from Mexico. In fact, the numbers of immigrants from Mexico, there's more people leaving the United States from Mexico than coming in. Uh, there is now more immigration from India and China than from Mexico and, and uh, coming into the United States. Um, the story, I think, of, of, of the fear of immigration, I think, is this one. This is the total number of Latinos. This is a, a 2010 number. I think Latinos are now 61 million. But the truth about Latinos is that this is the foreign born number. This number has been going down. Uh, so now 30% of Latinos in the United States are born abroad. 60%, 70%, I'm sorry, of Latinos are born and raised in the US. So I think what we see the fear is is that there's more Latinos and there is a stereotype that Latinos are immigrants so and they're all undocumented so so this number going up is creating an, an illusion that immigration is out of bounds and, and it's really just US born Latino children uh, that are uh, a very large proportion in the US. When you look at immigration, I mean, again, going back to the beginning, it, it, it's a global phenomenon, it, it, it's, it's our story. You can really not regulate it with policy. Uh, what we have noticed looking at policy is that it creates, it, it, it transforms patterns. In, in, in many ways, border controls have created a, a, a permanent population when it was a population that would come and go in many cases, uh, commuting cyclical migration was turning to a permanent migration with border controls. So, so we don't know what we do when we do policy in, in this particular case, because as I mentioned, it, it, it's really a flow that has been going for generations in, in, in the cases, particularly of Mexican migration. Uh, so, so our policy has just transformed it and, and done things that we didn't expect. And I think, you know, the question of the values uh, that, that raised Kennedy in 1965, you know, is, is, is 1964, I'm, I'm sorry, it's some of the questions that we're talking about today as well. You know, 
if this is a global phenomenon, if this is something that is, you know, it's like climate change, do we handle it with restrictive policies and isolation, or do we handle it with kind of more global thinking about immigration? Uh, I think those are the more important questions we should be asking. So, so I, I want to stop to give uh, Shelley some a chance to also present. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Reyes, for that uh, extremely informative uh, presentation. I think you said that history is really important at the beginning of your presentation. And I think you showed, um, even though most Americans think of America as a population of immigrants, they really don't know the rich and involved and complex history that you presented uh, beginning in the 17th century. So we've really had 400 <laughs> years of um, immigration uh, with all kinds of twists and turns. Uh, and I really want to thank you for enlightening us about the details of that long uh, and involved period. Now we'll turn to one of the topics that you mentioned, uh, and that is uh, DACA. And uh, even though the media uh, use that acronym, uh, they don't explain it very much. And I think we all would uh, really uh, appreciate uh, enlightening us about what that means. And so our second speaker this afternoon uh, is Professor Shelley Wilcox. And Professor Wilcox is a, member, is a professor in the philosophy department, and she holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of Colorado at Boulder. She works mainly in political philosophy and feminism with a special interest in issues of migration, membership, and global justice. Professor uh, Wilcox has published articles in philosophical studies, social theory and practice, and the Journal of Social Philosophy, and presented her work throughout North America and Europe. Her recent article on sanctuary policies in Public Affairs Quarterly was the first on the topic to appear in a prominent philosophical journal and has been the subject of several symposia and special sessions. Professor Wilcox is currently working on a book on the ethics of sanctuary. Professor Wilcox, it's a great pleasure to have you here this afternoon uh, talking about DACA. Great, well, thank you so much, Professor Cassiola, for inviting me to be with you this afternoon and Professor Reyes for that presentation. Um, I teach courses on the ethics of, of immigration and membership in the philosophy department and we address questions around, ethical questions, around the very questions that you identified, Professor Reyes, and that's, uh, you know, how many um, immigrants ought to be admitted, uh, which of the folks who you would ostensibly think want to come in ought to be admitted, and of course, um, what are the rights and duties, or what does the state owe immigrants once they're here? Um, and I always emphasize how just impossible it is to have these ethical discussions in a productive way in absence of a full understanding of the history of migration policy in the US. Um, so I'm so happy to see your presentation. I think it's really important to have that as a, as a background and a source of, of, of knowledge for our discussion about the election, which I think um, you know, for some people uh, raises ethical questions about how policies in the US ought to be oriented with respect to immigration. So I'm so glad that you are here with us. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about DACA and DAPA and the DREAM Act 
And I'll start by sharing my screen here so you can see my slides. Okay, uh, right, so I'll talk about each of these policies briefly. Um, I know that our focus today is on the federal election, but I'll also say a few words about what's going on in states as well. Um, I think that it's important for us to keep in mind that much immigration policy, at least in the, in the past four years, but, but preceding that as well, has taken place by way of executive order. Um, but if we're going to move towards a kind of comprehensive immigration reform that folks talk about, or even the passage of, of uh, the DREAM Act, we're gonna need congressional um, support and approval as well. So I'll just say a few words um, about the other aspects um, of the acts that bear on, on the election as well. Um, so I'll conclude then by saying, and this will be very brief, um, where the candidates stand with respect to these issues. Um, as Professor Reyes pointed out, there have been points in history, in fact, in recent history, where the Republican Party and the ruling Democratic Party didn't stand so very far from one another with respect to what they were supporting in terms of migration policy. And from some perspectives, uh, the Republicans were supporting what folks might call a more sort of progressive policy and Obama, as Professor Reyes mentioned, um, increased uh, deportations quite dramatically. Um, so this time around, it seems like there's a pretty stark contrast. So that part of the talk will be pretty brief. So let me begin here by saying a few words about um, DACA. Uh, this policy, which is the acronym DACA, stands for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. This was created in 2012 um, by then Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napoliano, after Congress had repeatedly failed to pass the DREAM Act, which would have enabled undocumented immigrants brought to the U.S. as children to eventually gain citizenship. And I'll talk more about the DREAM Act here in a few moments. What DACA does is provide temporary relief from deportation and work authorization to qualified applicants. So to be eligible for DACA, um, applicants must have arrived in the U.S. before turning 16 and been under the age of 31 on June 15, 2012, when it was um, enacted. They must have lived continuously in the U.S. since June 15, 2007. They must have been physically present in the U.S. on June 15, 2012, as well as the time that they, respect, uh, that they requested deferred action. They must have lacked legal immigration status on June 15, 2012, and either have been in school, have graduated from high school or obtained a GED, or been honorably discharged from the U.S. military or Coast Guard, and finally, Applicants must have not been convicted of a felony, a significant misdemeanor, um, or three other more, more minor misdemeanors, or otherwise pose a security threat. So it's interesting here, I, I couldn't help but notice, right, the, the ways in which Professor Reyes sort of broke up the eras of immigration enforcement and policy. And we can see the emphasis on so-called security concerns, right? Um, and, uh, and even recent concerns about the so-called like criminal threat that migrants pose, um, even back in the beginning of this policy, which as we know was enacted under the Obama administration. So as I, as I mentioned before, DACA originally, and this is the 2012 version, um, would have or did enable eligible young adults to work legally attend school and plan their lives without a constant threat of deportation for a two year period. It was renewable, but it's important to know um, that DACA did not provide legal permanent residency status to recipients. Now this version of DACA was in place for five years. Um, however, on September 5th of 2017, Acting Homeland Security Secretary Elaine Duke 
rescinded to the 200 or 2012 DACA memorandum and announced that there would be no new applications accepted and also announced a wind down that would occur for current enrollees. So it's worth, I think now sort of just again, flagging this issue um, about how far one, uh, whether the president or Congress ought to be the body that controls migration, our immigration policy, because the constitution gives that power to the Congress, but also um, further executive orders are only as strong as the, the, the sort of legality, but also as the president. So they're not binding in a way that congressional action, it's harder to undo a congressional policy than it is to undo an executive order. So we see a lot of sort of ping-ponging back and forth on these executive orders, and that's evident here with DACA. Um, so in the, in the rescission of DACA, it would have been no new applicants and also a wind down for current enrollees. Um, DACA's beneficiaries whose status was due to expire before March 5th of 2018 were permitted to renew their status for an additional two year um, period if they applied before October 5th, 2017, one month from the moment of the rescission order. However, any person for whom DACA would have expired after March 6th of 2018 would no longer have deferred action um, and or employment authorization. So this order, as some of us know, uh, got bounced up through the courts. Um, it, was, uh, it was opposed in a number of states and eventually challenged by US district courts in California, New York, Maryland, and District of Columbia, so in DC. Uh, the US Supreme Court agreed to review the legal challenges of the lower courts during its 2019-20 term. And on June 18th, which many of us remember this summer, uh, the court ruled in a somewhat surprising um, decision, I think to some, in a 5-4 decision that the Trump administration's attempt to terminate DACA was unlawful. <laughs> However, it's important to note the terms on which this, this um, judgment uh, expressed. And that is that the grounds were that the administration failed to properly explain its decision or consider alternatives to full rescission of the program in violation of the Administrative Procedure Act. And so what this means is that even though the court stayed the rescission, reversed the rescission, it ruled that the federal government ultimately retains the legal authority to end DACA if it does so in compliance with the Administrative Procedure Act. And so this is important because um, as we talk about at the end, right, there's a promise from Trump and the administration to, to try again with DACA and get it through the Supreme Court. And so it really was a procedural um, decision. It wasn't a decision about the nature of DACA. And in fact, the court ruled that the government does have the authority to end DACA if it does so um, in accordance with procedure. So following this uh, dis uh, court decision, the DACA program was technically restored to its state prior to the September um, 2017 rescission. The US uh, Citizenship and Immigration Services subsequently began accepting some initial DACA applications, but it failed to approve or adjudicate any of these forms. And approximately six weeks after the Supreme Court's decision, Acting Secretary of Homeland Security Chad Wolf issued a memorandum making major changes to DACA. And this is what we have as it stands, which is that since June, uh, current and prior DACA recipients can continue to apply to renew their protection. However, the validity period has been reduced to one year. So DACA recipients must now apply to renew their protections annually rather than every two years. And also that um, the US will reject all initial DACA requests from people who are eligible but haven't previously participated. And so um, it, it's, uh, 
it, it, there are several sources that suggest that there are roughly about 800,000 people who have been approved from DACA since 2012 to give us an idea of, of who um, the folks were talking about. So along with DACA, there was a sort of less discussed um, policy that is called DAPA. And DAPA was initiated or enacted on November 20th in 2014, when Obama signed an executive order establishing a new deferred action program called Deferred Action for Parents of Americans and Lawful Permanent Residents, or DAPA. DAPA would have allowed certain parents of US citizens and lawful permanent residents, or green card holders, right, um, to apply for temporary protection from deportation as well as work permits. And here the applicants would have needed to meet the following requirements. Been a parent of a US citizen or a lawful permanent resident, having lived continuously in the US since 2010, having been present in the US on, in 2014 when the law was, or the executive order was enacted, um, not have lawful immigration status at that time, and also not have been committed of, commit, convicted of certain criminal offenses, including any felonies and some misdemeanors. So the estimates here are that more than 10 million people in the US reside in a household with at least one adult who would have been eligible for DAPA, with two thirds of those adults having lived in the US for 10 years or more. So when combined with DACA, DAPA would have delayed deportation for slightly less than half of the 11 million unauthorized migrants in the US. However, in 2014, Texas and 25 other states, all of which had Republican governors, sued in district court of the Southern District of Texas, asking the court to enjoin the implementation of DAPA. A temporary injunction was issued in February 2015, blocking the program from going into effect while the lawsuits proceeded, and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed the preliminary uh, injunction in May of 2015. The case finally made its way to the Supreme Court, which in a 4-4 at the time split decision in June of 2016, issued a ruling that left in place the lower court's pre preliminary injunction blocking the program. On June 15th, 2017, the Trump administration announced a rescission of the DAPA order. So it has now been rescinded. So let's finally look then at the DREAM Act, which is in the background here, importantly. The first version of the, of the DREAM Act, which is the acronym for the Development, Relief, and Education of Alien Minors Act, was introduced in 2001. As a result, young undocumented immigrants have since been called dreamers. Um, over the course of the last 19 years, at least 10 versions of the DREAM Act have been introduced in Congress. While various versions of the Act have contained some key differences, they all would have provided a pathway to legal status for undocumented youth who came to the U.S. as children. Despite bipartisan support of the bill, none have become law. The DREAM Act came the closest in 2010, when it passed the House of Representatives, but it fell just five votes short of the 60 votes it would have needed to proceed in the Senate. In 2017, uh, Senators Lindsey Graham who, uh, and Richard Durbin introduced a version of the DREAM Act in the Senate and Representatives Robal Allard and Ross Lehinthin um, introduced a partner version in the House of Representatives. That year, members of the House introduced several other legislative proposals to address the legal status of undocumented youth, most of which were variants of the DREAM Act. And although some of these bills drew significant support, none became law. The most recent version of the DREAM Act, which is um, House Resolution 2820, was introduced in May 2019. Um, the House Judiciary Committee passed that bill on May 22nd in 2019, and the bill subsequently was combined with another bill called the American Promise Act of 2019 
to form the American Dream and Promise Act of 2019. This bill would provide permanent legal status to dreamers as well as beneficiaries of two humanitarian programs, TPS, so Temporary Protected Status, and Deferred Enforced Departure. So the, the House voted on that in, 2000, in, in June and passed it at a margin of 237 to 187. So this act would have provided current, former, and future undocumented high school graduates and GED recipients a pathway to US citizenship through college, work, or the armed services. So participation in one of those, um, in one of those uh, organizations. Um, it outlines a three-step process. So the first step here is conditional permanent residence. And this, there we go with that. Okay, so conditional permanent residence means that an individual would be eligible to obtain conditional permanent residence status for up to 10 years, which includes work authorization if the person meets all of the following conditions. Entered the US under the age of 18, entered four years prior to the bill's enactment and has been continually present since, has been admitted to college or technical education school, has graduated from high school or obtained a GED, or is currently enrolled in secondary school or program assisting school students to obtain a high school diploma or a GED. And again, the familiar has not been convicted of any crime in this case involving moral turpitude or controlled substance abuse, any crime punishable by more than one year in prison or three or more offenses under state and federal uh, law. So there's an exception there for offenses which are essential to a person's immigration status. So for instance, um, being in the US without papers qualifies as, um, as an offense, right? But it's, it's exempted from that. So under the terms of this bill, uh, the U Secretary of Homeland Security can issue waivers for humanitarian purposes or for family unity, and when the waiver is otherwise in the public interest. Additionally, anyone who is currently has DACA would be granted a swift path to CPR, to conditional permanent residence status. The next stage is legal permanent residence. Here, anyone who maintains CPR status could apply for a green card status. Uh, by satisfying one of the following requirements, and that's completing at least two years in good standing of college or a program leading to a certificate or credential from a career or technical school, completing at least two years of military service with an honorable discharge if the discharge has happened, and also or demonstrating employment over a total of three years, and at least 75% of that time, the individual has employment authorization. So individuals who couldn't meet one of these qualifications could apply for a hardship waiver if the applicant is a person with disabilities, a full-time caregiver of a minor child, or for whom removal would cause extreme hardship to a spouse, parent, or child who is a citizen or a legal permanent resident of the US. So finally, the last stage here is naturalization. And uh, this is, says this um, aspect of the program, uh, stipulates that after maintaining legal permanent residency for five years, an individual can generally apply to become a U.S. citizen through the normal naturalization process. So this is a long, the DREAM Act, right? It's, it's, it's a long process that could culminate um, in naturalization after a number of years. And the Migration Policy Institute uh, suggests that as many as 2.3 individuals would qualify at least for conditional permanent residency status under this 2019 version of the DREAM Act, which would put them on a path to citizenship. Um, so I'll say just a couple of words about state policies. So um, states, as we would imagine, right, cannot, uh, legalize the status of undocumented immigrants, but they can address some collateral issues that stem from being undocumented. And we have in all 50 states in the District of Columbia, um, DACA recipients are able to get driver's licenses. Uh, in numerous states have enacted legislation 
that may help, that help to help many, uh, excuse me, dreamers overcome barriers to higher education and employment. And pursuant to these laws and policy, many dreamer students are able to attend state universities and qualify for in-state tuition or financial aid. Some may also qualify for licenses for certain professional or trade occupations. Uh, colleges and universities also have their own policies with respect to admitting undocumented students. Some deny dreamers uh, um, admission while others allow them to attend. And even when undocumented um, students are allowed to attend college, however, tuition's often prohibitively expensive. Um, so some students also, or some universities also enable undocumented students to uh, pay in-state tuition, um, even though they're not uh, eligible for federal loans or work study or other um, forms of financial assistance. And finally, um, many professional and trade industries at the state level, so medical, education, cosmetology, um, require licensure um, to practice in that state. And under federal law, undocumented immigrants are barred from receiving a professional license unless legislation is implemented within individual states um, that permits the issuance of these or issuance of these licenses. And currently, 13 states, including California, extend certain professional licenses to undocumented migrants. So, so what do we? What can I say that we don't already know? Um, I'll just say very briefly, um, we can expect the following, I think. Um, Trump, despite what we really see about his views on many um, immigration policies, he's, he's sent confusing signals about DACA. I think it's partly because there's a, a pretty wide spread or there's more popular support probably for DACA than there are for some of the other um, uh, migration policies that he's addressed. However, if he is reelected, um, I think we can see, be fairly certain um, to expect that his administration will attempt to make another attempt or will make another attempt to end uh, DACA. Uh, and it's likely given the Supreme Court as it's going right, that that attempt may well be successful, given particularly and especially the way that the former ruling was so narrow and procedural. Uh, we also probably know uh, Trump opposes efforts to revise DAPA and he opposes efforts to pass any version of the DREAM Act. Biden, on the other hand, uh, you know, we've seen him sort of support something like comprehensive immigration reform in other venues. It hasn't come up yet so much in this. It'll be interesting to see how it goes in the debates. Um, I think it's very clear uh, that he has promised to reinstate and extend DACA, that he promises to reinstate DAPA, and that he supports um, the DREAM Act as well. So finally, um, I do just want to sort of mention that any legislation outside of an executive order, right, has got to go through Congress. And so congressional races matter as well. And the Senate particularly matters because we've seen the DREAM Act pass through the House and I think we would continue to do so, and it's stalling out in the Senate. So that race for those um, folks who support the DREAM Act and would like to see the DREAM Act make DACA no longer necessary, right? And then maybe uh, some kind of congressional protection for DAPA, that Senate race matters as well as the presidential race. Because as we mentioned before, those executive orders, they're just not that, um, they're not that stable. So additionally, um, I think it's worth kind of mentioning, it's not just the DREAM Act that matters. It's also whether folks are willing to um, or, or interested in passing what activists have called a clean dream act. So what we've seen in the past is every time Trump has given mixed signals about possibly supporting DACA, it always comes with um, preconditions about border wall funding, about reduced visas for work permits, about more public charge restrictions that essentially pits dreamers against other immigrant populations 
Um, so we can see why activists would support a clean DREAM Act as opposed to just any old DREAM Act at great cost to other migrant um, populations. And who's in the Senate there matters a lot as, as well. We know, I think, if, if, I think Trump would try to end DACA, but to the extent that he would try to suggest that he wouldn't on the way, he would enact huge um, uh, asks in terms of, of supporting anything like the DREAM Act. And again, that would be border wall funding, increased deportations and funding for ICE, and a shift to an employment-based immigration system as opposed to a family reunification system. Um, okay, so I'll stop there. I can see there's a bunch of questions and we don't have that much time. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much, Professor Wilcox. I think uh, your presentation shows the complexity of the various versions of DACA and I did not know about DAPA, but that seems to be uh, a really important expansion uh, beyond um, college age students. I know we have some questions, so let me look at the questions. Um, uh, let's see. Um, um, I know this might be somewhat controversial, uh, Belinda. Can you say something about so-called anchor babies? You're, mu you're muted. Yeah. Belinda, can you turn your mic on? Okay. Yeah, I am. Um, the first thing that I'll say is that most migrants are not children and most migrants are not pregnant women. Uh, the number of those cases are very, very, very minute. It is very much uh, a media created thing. So, so the fear of this being so predominant around the immigrant population is not the case. But apart from that, the anchor baby idea is that all of these undocumented women are coming over here to have babies so that they can stay in the United States. Again, most migrants are men. There are a lot of women. There's a lot more women migration now, but they tend to be more legal migrants. Uh, so, so, I mean, when you, you need to look at the data to really get an idea of whether this is important or not. And, and I would say it's, it's not the story of migration. The story of migration is very different. I mean, it is not to come and have babies in the States. Now, we are all anchor babies in a way too. Uh, I mean, the story of the US is just multiple generations of the first immigrant that showed up. So we are all anchor babies. Uh, so I don't know. I guess those will be my two responses. Okay, let me just clarify one thing. The baby being born in the United States has citizenship. Does that confer citizenship on the mother as well? Not necessarily. No, that would be another process. Well, this is the DAPA conversation that I think, Shelley, you could probably add a little bit more. So the uh, mother doesn't get no. automatic citizenship? No, that's a myth, right? That's a myth. I see. Okay. Well, that clarifies something about that. Um, let's see. Um, This is a question, uh, let's see. We haven't talked about sanctuary cities. Uh, do, do either of you want to comment about sanctuary cities? Professor Wilcox, I know you've been studying sanctuary cities. Uh, do you want to say a few words about it? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, what can I say? Um, that's important to note is that um, we, well, there are a lot of misunderstandings, I think, and, and myths around sanctuary cities. I also think there are a number of justifications for sanctuary policies. So I guess I want to say that the whole, um, the whole issue 
is much more complex than we usually see. Now, uh, the debate oftentimes sort of caches around, um, caches out in terms of issues around public safety, where on one hand you have um, people who are opposed to sanctuary policies that are arguing that policies sort of make the town or jurisdiction safe for criminal migrants. And on the other hand, the proponents of sanctuary policies are arguing that actually sanctuary policies themselves, not cooperative understandings or agreements with ICE, are the policies that will make the local jurisdiction safer. And the reasoning there is that um, the partnerships with ICE um, make local folks unsafe. For one thing, they draw police attention, local police attention away from community policing and the sorts of activities and responsibilities um, that they're tasked with by the nature of police departments and sort of puts them in service with ICE, right? So they're, they're acting as federal immigration um, uh, agents rather than as local police force. And that essentially externalizes the cost of ICE to local communities. So insofar as San Francisco is paying and ICE doesn't pick up the cost of the local cops, their time when they're working as agents of, of immigration enforcement, San Francisco pays for that. And so we're essentially subsidizing the federal argue the, the supporters, right? Uh, we're essentially uh, subsidizing ICE's budget by letting our police do the work of ICE. And then of course, there's the concern about um, the kinds of distrust and um, misunderstandings that are generated by having either local police or local hospital workers or people working in courthouses or people working in educational um, um, institutions insofar as they're sharing information with ICE, that puts the rest of us all at risk. Um, so it's going to be much less likely that somebody from either a documented or undocumented migrant community is going to report a crime or cooperate with police if they're concerned that they will either themselves be deported, somebody in their family will be deported, or they will be, an, an, and I'll stop, I can tell I'm getting like really uh, wound up here, but it's not just undocumented migrants that get deported by ICE, okay? So documented migrants also get mistakenly deported by ICE. Uh -huh. So, the, um, so that's, the, that's the debate around the safety, public safety issue. There are other justifications for sanctuary policies as well, but that just sort of gives us the landscape of the sort of ethical debate and the policy debate about that one justification, which is the most prominent. Thanks. Um, there was a question uh, that maybe my political orientation was drawn to, and it has to do with borders. And the question asked, um, do you think uh, we can do without borders? And I wanted to add a comment. Um, the way I'm ignorant about immigration, but uh, the point seems to be if people were happy where they lived, if they were not poor and oppressed uh, by the state government where they lived, there would not be much migration. Migration seems to be a function of unhappiness or um, dissatisfaction with freedom where they are. And and so I, I wonder if either of you would comment about this question. If we were one world government and all the 200 states were part of that, what would the state of migration be? Would, would the elimination of national borders resolve migration issues? Could I? Uh, Belinda, I can imagine that you have a lot to say. I just want to separate the issues, Joel. It doesn't, we can't conflate world government and open borders. 
there's not necessarily an entailment between opening borders or making borders more porous and then a world government. Nobody supports a world government for obvious reasons. Okay. So folks who support open borders, they're not arguing for something like that. They are only arguing for open borders insofar as open borders would be possible um, in the international state system as we understand it. And then the question is, could that really work or not? So I'll let, I'll let you look I, I think that's probably. A good correction. And that would mean, let me take the questioners, um, which was very brief. Let me see if I can understand it. Universal open borders, is, is that acceptable? Where every country would have open borders? Is that more realistic? Do you think? So I don't know, Belinda. Do you wanna? I don't wanna dominate this. Oh, it seemed like you had some ideas about yeah, how I mean, maybe yeah, migrations yeah. created by borders. Yeah, a, the common market in Europe does not have borders from within countries. I mean, there is already that experiment happening. Uh, it's called the European Common Market. Uh, people move between those countries without borders. Uh, and there is different ideas about how the other fits there. I, but I, I do want to clarify another thing. Migration is not the cause of poverty. I mean, poverty is not the cause of migration. If not, in fact, the poorest countries are not the ones who send the immigrants. And that it, it's not that people, in fact, you have to have a relationship between the sending and the receiving country. In many cases, what has led to migration has been U.S. intervention, has been, in fact, either factories moving and hiring people and creating relationships that then they hired the cousin that went over there, and then that starts building a network of relationships. Or the labor recruitment that I mentioned to you that purposely still today, companies go to Mexican towns to hire people. That is happening today. You go to a, a Michoacan, and you will have labor recruiters from Canada going to Mexico or Central America to hire people. So most of the migration that you see today is part of a global system, part of globalization. I mean, borders are falling apart just on globalization alone. You know, so it, it is just part of that whole system that, 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 that exists. Uh, uh, and then we also have had specific policies. The Bracero program was an agreement between the U.S. that I'm going to have open borders with you. So historically, we have also done it with Mexico and Canada. Uh, we could have done an AFTA that said we'll have open borders again. We used to have them. But we could say, again, we're going to have open borders with Mexico. So, so it's not a fantasy. We have had it, and we have an experiment in Europe that is doing it right now. The question, it's always one of race, uh, I got to say. Do we want to allow those brown people that we think are not the workers we want, but we do hire them all the time, or we not? Do we define them as citizens of our nation and accept them or not? So, so the question is a little bit different. We have open borders. Anybody that wants to come to the US comes and they get hired. We just don't have them in the, in, in, in the paper. You know what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that for me, the more reasonable thing is to have these conversations over the table. Climate change is creating awful patterns of migration that will transform how we see the world. If we continue to have these conversations about borders, what's going to happen to those people? You know what I mean? So, so we need to change the conversation and be real with what is happening and, and, and move from these ideas of territoriality the way we're doing it right now. Uh, I'm very glad that you mentioned that last point, Belinda, because as a student of the environment, I wasn't going to let this session end uh, without mentioning the idea of environmental refugees or climate change migrants. And here, the issue is um, a lot clearer 
than in some of the other uh, aspects of this issue, uh, of this broader issue, from an ethical point of view, the northern, the global north has contributed a much greater proportion of greenhouse gases uh, than the global south. And one could uh, argue uh, that the global north nations have an obligation to accept the consequences, to, to accept the situation that they have created, which the, the later industrialized nations in the global south have not contributed to. And as the consequences of climate change worsen, there will be more and more of refugees or migrants forced from their home by flooding or by other consequences. And it seems to me that on the discussion table of a humane ethical country in the North would be policy with regard to climate change refugees. And um, I'm not sure that's even entered the, the language of the American political system, um, which we need to make a change in. I am looking at the time. Um, you can have the last word, Shelley. Um, I was just going to say, I mean, I think there, Belinda's point about the kinds of um, ways that we need to think openly and creatively once we take migration as it is, rather than thinking that we can engineer it away by increasingly draconian policies, is also an issue about territory. So I think if we, if we construct climate, people displaced by climate change as refugees, it narrows the scope of what that might be owed to them. But it might also be that territory is owed to these um, folks who are forced to move by these environmental changes, right? So I, I kind of would encourage us to think even beyond a sort of refugee paradigm um, to ask greater questions about what this demands ethically. And it might be changes to the way that we understand the relationship between sovereignty and territory. That is a profound question that would require another <laughs> webinar. Uh, but I do think it's an important point to end. Uh, Belinda, do you want to make a final point before we conclude? No, I, I, I hope it is part of the debate. Uh, I mean, f I know for the Latino population, this is a critical issue. So, so if they don't talk about it, they're, they're missing who could be the critical deciding vote in this election. So, so I really hope they address issues of immigration. I will make uh, an announcement just in case there are any viewers who are not aware that the first presidential debate will be occurring in about 18 minutes. So you, you should be aware of that on the West Coast. Uh, it will begin at 6 o'clock. Um, I, as a political scientist, I think perhaps a concluding point to try to uh, bring together both of your presentations. And I think this is an urgent humanitarian, ethical, a practical set of issues that the political system has really failed to address. And we often talk about mistakes that the political system makes uh, areas of commission. What we really have here, and I think um, in, in Professor Wilcox's uh, legislative history uh, regarding DACA and DAPA, we have the political system's errors of omission. And we need to change that. And if anyone doubts how important voting is, and how important the political system is in their lives, this discussion shows it affects some millions of people directly, but it affects all of us in various degrees. And we need a political system that is willing to dialogue and debate, but act as well. So I wanna thank you both. 
Professor Reyes and Professor Wilcox. And I want to thank the viewers for hanging in there a little bit longer uh, than we usually do. And next week, we will talk about the, a similar urgent issue with practical consequences, and that is healthcare and the whole issue of healthcare. So watch the debate. If you can't watch it, I'm sure there will be replays. And I will see you next week at 4 o'clock. Thank you both for a terrific presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so Good much. Night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, you very night. much.